Please take your Bibles and just stay there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, as Callum was reading through that, you probably noticed that this chapter is cut in half on two very different topics. You know, the first 16 verses were about, you know, the length of your hair, how long the hair, hair of a woman should be, how long the length of a man should be. It just seems to come out of nowhere, and then all of a sudden it changes to the Lord's Supper and how we ought to, um, you know, partake of the Lord's Supper and, you know, people shouldn't be basically having their own supper. Um, it's something that we should be waiting for uh, with one another. So this chapter, you could easily preach two sermons out of this because you've got two very different topics at hand. Now, I want to focus primarily there. Uh, well, let's look at verse 26. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread, this is a memory verse, of course. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So the title of, this mor the, title of the sermon this morning is uh, Show the Lord's Death. Show the Lord's death. Now, you notice there that that word show in, in the King James Bible is spelled shoe. Like we would pronounce it shoe, right? Um, that's just the old English way of, of, of spelling show. And in fact, if you look at how to pronounce that word shoe, they still pronounced it as show. So obviously, as the English language developed, you know, they changed it to the O, just so it's a bit more obvious the way we pronounce the English word. But uh, you'll never find in your King James Bible the word show, S-H-O-W, spelt that way. It's always spelt S-H-E-W. So the title is Show the Lord's Death. How do we as a church show the Lord's Death? Well, we see it there in that verse, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. Some people call that the Lord's Supper. I call it the Lord's Supper, I guess. You see that reference in this chapter. It can also be called the Lord's Table. It can also be called Communion. Okay, some people just call it the breaking of bread. I've heard that as well. Um, but show the Lord's death. So I really want to focus primarily on the communion, the Lord's Supper side of this chapter. Though I will briefly cover the first 16 uh, verses as well. But I think at some point I probably want to take those verses and preach on, you know, the length of hair and how people ought to be dressed. You know, the differences between man and woman and those kind of things. But let's start off with verse number 1. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. The Bible reads, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So again, you know, you know the problems that this church had. We know that they were worshipping man. They were men followers. Okay? They, had risen, they had lifted man in their heart to the same level that they ought to raise Jesus Christ. Okay? But there's nothing wrong with following men. There's nothing wrong with having godly men that you look up to and set a good example for you. Paul is saying here, hey, be followers of me, but what's the condition of being a follower of Paul, even as I also am of Christ? So the only reason you ought to follow a man, the only reason you ought to look at a man as a good example, is if they are following Jesus Christ. Okay? And the only way you're going to know if they're following Jesus Christ is knowing the Bible. Okay? Because if you just take the word of man, how do you know if they're following Jesus Christ? But if you know the Bible, if you read the Bible, if you become familiar with the, the topics at hand, you become familiar with doctrines, you know why you stand on certain doctrines, then you will know when men have deviated from Jesus Christ. And in that case, obviously, you do not want to follow men if they have deviated away from Jesus Christ. So the first, you know, the Corinthian church, they could literally follow Paul because they knew him, they could see him, they could meet with him. But we too can also follow Paul. We too can follow Paul. Why? Because we've been left with the many epistles in the Bible that he has written. So we can read what Paul has told the churches and we can say, hey, that's us following Paul because we too can follow after the things that were written in these epistles, 1 Corinthians being one of them. So if we follow what is written in the Word of God, hey, then we are following Christ. Isn't that, that's, that's logic, right? If we follow the words of God, we are following Christ. Verse number two. Now I praise you, brethren... So Paul is praising this church about a few little things, okay? I know there's been a lot of problems, but he praises them for a few things that they're doing. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things. So at least this church was remembering Paul, right? Yes, they were exalting him higher than they ought to in some cases, but at least they had remembered him. They were remembering him in prayers. And let me encourage you guys as a church, you know, as a church, but also in your personal prayer life, that you remember myself, you know, as the pastor, as the bishop of this church, but also other men that are pastors and leaders of their church, um, or other, you know, missionaries or evangelists, 
please remember these people because if the devil's going to attack a church, if the devil's going to attack anybody, it's always going to be with the leadership first of all because if they can take down the pastor, if the devil can take down the pastor, can take down the bishop, he will have a much easier way, uh, much easier way of, of taking down the church. So please remember the leaders of a church in prayer. He says, I praise you for that, that you remember me in all things. You remember the things that I need to do. You know, you, you consider the needs that I have and you pray for me and keep the ordinances. So at least this church is keeping some of the ordinances that he says, as I delivered them to you. Okay, now the question is, what are ordinances? And I, I think sometimes some churches or basically every church maybe uh, takes this word a little too, too extreme. Like for example, what I mean by this, the word ordinances, I should say. Many Baptist churches including ours, uh, you know, I would say, yeah, we have two ordinances in this church. Okay, I haven't got a problem with using that word. And when, when, we, when Baptist churches often say we have two ordinances, those ordinances are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Okay, because both of those things are remembering the crucifixion of Christ. Okay, and they're ordinances. And I, I haven't got a problem with saying that. But what you will understand, if you understand what ordinance means, it just means things that are set in order. So someone in authority has, has asked a church, hey, to do things orderly, these are things that you need to do. In other words, a church can have, multi, like, can have many ordinances, right? Preaching from the Word of God, we can say is an ordinance. We've been ordered to do that. We've been commanded to preach the Word of God. Going soul winning is an ordinance, okay? We've been commanded to go soul winning. Singing praises to God is an ordinance. I mean, anything that you can find in the Bible that we're commanded to do, that we've been, that's been set in order for a church to do, is an ordinance. Okay, that's what it means. Now, just have a, quick, very, have a quick look at the last verse in this chapter, verse 34, and just look at the end of this. Okay, it says here, And the rest will I set in order when I come. So Paul is saying, hey, I praise you for remembering the ordinances that I left you, but I'm going to set more things in order when I come to see you. So there's more ordinances to come, okay? So don't get too carried away. You know, when you read ordinance in the Bible, don't automatically assume, oh, that's baptism and the Lord's Supper. Yes, I know we, we, in, in our modern churches we use that term to describe those two ordinances, but that's not necessarily what the Bible means. Now, they are ordinances, okay? But there are many more ordinances that a church ought to do. And of course, you know, you know the Bible, you, you'll know what they are. Okay, now look at verse number three. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So here we have a level of authority, okay? We have the woman, and the, the, the authority or the head of the woman is the man. And let me just say very quickly, it's not every man is the head of a woman. So if you're a woman today, it's not that every man in the world is your head, okay? The, the head of a woman and we've looked at this before when we're looking at, uh, kind of, we're talking about marriage. Obviously, the head of the woman is her husband. But if she's single, who's her head? Her father. Okay? Now, in, in a perfect scenario, a woman should always have a head over her, should always have an authority over her. When she's single, before she's married, it's a father. But when she's married, that becomes her husband. So we always see that the man is in the authority of the woman. But who's in authority of the man? Jesus Christ. And who's in authority of Christ? It says God, and obviously that's a reference to God the Father, because Jesus Christ is subject to the Father. Man is subject to Christ, and woman ought to be subject to man. So we see this order that God plays out for us, and we, we need that to understand the rest of the verses that we have here. Verse number four, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, this honoreth his head. Now what you understand here, so it's saying, look, a man should not have his head covered, while he's praying or preaching. Now, this isn't something we really deal with today in our, in our modern world, but you may have seen, maybe you've seen like videos like of old, older churches or maybe even movies where people go to church and, you know, in some societies it was normal for a man to have a hat. You know, they, they, they travel wearing a hat. But it's like when we see when they get to church, they take off the hat. Or when they go to pray, they take off the hat. That's because they're, they're applying these verses and they know, hey, when, I, when I'm praying or, or preaching, I need to make sure that I take that hat off. I don't have my head covered because that's, that dishonors his head. And that head we just read was Jesus Christ. 
Look at verse number 5. And every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, this honor of her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. So we'll see soon that a woman who has her head uncovered is a woman who has short hair because we'll see later on that her hair has been given to her for a covering. Okay? Now, if that dishonors her head, that dishonors her husband or it dishonors her father. Okay? So a, a woman ought to have long hair. I mean, that, that is the practice. And when we look out here, you'll see, you know, most women here have long hair and most men here have short hair. And that's not even people that are at church. These are people that are in the world out the window here. And so, you know, we can, yes, we can look at our church, but we can see, hey, it's just common practice. Everybody knows that men ought to have short hair and that women ought to have long hair. And when those things are reversed, it kind of stands out, doesn't it? You see a long, man with long hair, it, you kind of, oh, it, it, it you know, brings to your attention. Or you see a woman with short hair, it, it brings your attention there because they're trying to make a statement. They're trying to rebel against, you know, the norm and ultimately rebe rebel against God. But it's, it's to make a statement and then have a look at uh, verse, number, verse number six. Well, actually, before I read that, it says, for that is even all one as if she was shaven. So if a woman has her hair, head uncovered, has short hair, he's saying, again, sarcastically, we've seen that Paul is pretty sarcastic, she might as well just be shaven. She might as well just shave all her hair off. I mean, if she's going to have short hair, just, just cut it all off, right? Now, obviously, he's not saying that's something that we should do. Because look at verse number six. For if the woman be not covered, so if she doesn't have the long hair, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, which it is, it is a shame for a woman to have shaven or shorn hair, let her be covered. So it's not saying, hey, just, just shave her hair. Just, just take her and shave her hair because it's short. It's saying, look, it's a shame. So you might as well just have your hair covered. You might as well just grow your hair long, just like every woman, so you would not be ashamed and that you would not be dishonoring the head that Christ has put above you, being again the husband or the father. Now look at verse number seven. Now, I don't, look, let, let me just, before I keep reading, these are the instructions of the Word of God, okay? Women ought to have long hair and men ought to have short hair, okay? These are just the instructions from the Word of God. This isn't like this, you know, oh man, the Bible's full of rules and regulations. It's so hard to obey the Word of God. Hey, it ought to be easy. These things are, are natural. We'll see, we'll see shortly, this is, this, is, this is nature. People know that's the case. You don't need to read this in the Bible to know that women ought to have long hair and men ought to have short hair. God put that in our minds. God put that in our DNA. And we'll see societies throughout the world have always done this. This has always been the norm in society. And when society have not done this, that's been the exception to the rule. But let's look at verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Okay, so man, if you know, was created in the image of God, and then it says that the woman was created, when Eve was created, she was created in the image of the man. Okay, it's kind of repeating the same thing here in verse 7. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was, man, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So ladies, let me just say this a few things. You were created for the man. Okay, now that might sound like, oh, I can't believe, I can't believe Kevin just said that, that oh, we were made for man. But how many times have you heard, you know, women say, oh, you know, my husband, he can't do anything without me. You know, I mean, look, if not for my wife, I would have lost my car keys long ago. My wife, I'm the one that takes the car keys. I put them somewhere. But Christina always knows where my car keys are, all right? Because she's my help, right? God created a woman to be the help meet for the man, suitable for the man. And that's the case. Yet yeah, it's true. Ladies, we need you. Man needs you. Why? Because we just got this mind to do work. We just get things done. But we're not very tidy. We're not very neat, all right? We're not very organized. We need our wives to help in that area. And that's what women are really good at. They're really good at multitasking. They're really good at organization skills. They're really good at administration kind of tasks. That's why they make such good homemakers. That's why they make such good mothers raising godly children while the man just gets out and does work and, and raises you know, the income that he needs for his family. So it's not to put down women that you were created for men. That's exalt, that exalts women. 
that ought to make you feel good. Hey, you know, the man needs us. You know, this isn't just, you know, we're talking about this is a man's world. Yeah, no, but it's a man's world because they needed the women to help them make it the man's world. Hey, this, this is a compatibility. God created man and women differently so we could achieve and do great things together. Look at verse number 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, I've heard some weird teaching about this. So first of all, let's just understand the first part. For this cause, for this reason, ought the woman to have power on her head. Again, we're talking about the authority. Okay, so a woman ought to have, again, the father or the husband as their authority to be that helper, you know, to the husband, even a helper to the father. Okay? And then it says, because of the angels. Now, again, I've, I've heard some weird things here. Again, 1 Corinthians 11 mentions angels a few times. And I, it, it always takes me a little while to sort of figure out what it means by that. But I've heard some crazy teaching. Have you, if you guys have heard this, let me see it show of hands. But I've heard that this is a teaching where angels, basically, if women don't have long hair, or they're not under the authority of a man, then angels will find those women attractive and try to marry them. And that comes from a teaching in Genesis 6, okay? And we won't go into all that now. But has anyone heard that before? Just for this, in this reference? Okay, I've heard it taught, which I find totally, like, where's that come from? It's just out of left field. Well, that's right, out of left field, okay? But um, if we understand, I think we can understand this, because it's all about the authority. It's saying that the man has the power over the woman because of the angels. So like the angels, in the same way as the angels, because in the same way the angels have an authority that's God, right? They do the Lord's wi- uh, bidding. They do the Lord's will. They serve the Lord or they serve man if the Lord sends them to do so. And so in the same way that God is the authority to the angels, in the same way, you know, a man is the authority or the power of the woman. I think that's the proper way to understand that verse. Verse number 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man, in the Lord. So the, the, it's not better. It, it, it's being a man or being a woman, it's, one's not better than the other. Okay? As far as the Lord is concerned, you know, the man is with, uh, neither is the man without the woman and neither the woman without the man. We both need one another. Both sexes need one another to complement one another, to fulfill one another, uh, to do great things together. And then verse 12, for the woman, for as the woman is of the man, so this is talking about Eve, right? Because without Eve, like when, Adam, when, when Eve was created, she was, the, a rib was taken out of Adam, okay? So for as the woman is of the man, also the authority there, even so the man also by the woman, but all things of God. So of course, how can a man also by the woman? Because obviously women give birth and, you know, without women, there would be no men in that sense. You know, you know Eve is called the mother of all li- living, so as far as God is concerned, but all things of God, this is God's plan. Man is not better than woman. Woman is not better than man. But God sets things in order, has an authority to make sure that we can complement one another and have great marriages, okay? Because as soon as you break that authority in your marriage, it's going to hurt your marriage. It's going to start shaking the very foundations that God put in place as far as, as, far as the authority structure is concerned. It's God's way. Verse 13. Judge in yourselves... Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? So that word comely basically means beautiful or proper. You know, is it beautiful, is it proper that a woman who is uncovered, a woman with short hair, pray unto God? Is that proper? Is it nice? And yet we have women like this Joyce Myers, right? This this, this woman preacher that a lot of people look up to, a lot of people love, and you see how short her hair is. You know, I've seen men with longer hair than what she's got. And the Bible's saying here, hey, it's not comely, it's not proper, it's not suitable, it's not beautiful, it's not pretty, it's disgusting in the sight of God that a woman like that would stand up behind a pulpit, pray to the Lord, preach, you know, the Word of God, and hey, that's not God's plan. That is wrong. And that woman ought to be kicked out, and a man should be put behind that pulpit. Well, first of all, that church shouldn't exist because they teach a false gospel anyway. But hey, you know, that's the way of the world. They, you know, they look at verses like this, and they just want to break what God has set into place. Hey, and this isn't even necessarily biblical teaching. This is what the whole world does, who don't even know God. They recognize that women ought to have long hair and men ought to have short hair. Verse 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you? Isn't that just natural? Isn't that just common? Isn't it just common sense? 
that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. So long hair on a man is a shame to a man. Okay? Now let me just say this very quickly. When you see paintings or pictures of the New Testament, you see Jesus and his disciples, or you see movies or whatever of Jesus Christ, how many times do you see him with long hair? Pretty much every movie, right? I can think of one. I can think of one called Miracle Maker. It was this sort of, um, it's a kid's it's kind of um, a claymation kind of movie. And they, they, they had Jesus with short hair, you know. But most movies that you watch, you know, you see Jesus with his long hair, or his disciples looking really rugged with long hair as well. Judas usually has long hair as well. Um, but the Bible says here, hey, having long hair is a shame. So would Jesus, who is the Word of God, who is the living Word of God, right, who, these are the, his words, right? It's not just Paul's words. These, these are the, the words of God. It's the, it's the words of Jesus. If he says it's a shame for a man to have long hair, would Jesus have long hair? Of course not, right? It just, it, it disgraces who Jesus Christ is, those images, okay? But you know what? You know, these paintings, and these movies, they're trying to influence our mind. What they're trying to do is make us think that short hair on a man is some sort of modern trend. It's just something that, that's relatively new. Okay, and in the past, again, you see, you know, sort of movies or whatever, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying you should watch these movies, but obviously that I've, many times just show long hair on a man. But, you know, during the New Testament times, you know, the, the Roman Empire, was, they were in, in power, weren't they? They were the ones that had conquered, you know, much of the, much, uh, much of the world and had conquered uh, Israel. And yet when you look at the, the, you know, you can still see, you, you still have Roman coins. And on the back of those coins, you'll see a Caesar. And they always have short hair. In those days, it was normal, even in the Roman Empire, which were, were not Christians at that time, okay? They didn't have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even they knew that men were to have short hair, okay? Um, you know, even, and, and some say, well, that was, you know, and I've heard this, well, it became common during the Roman Empire days, because they know we can easily see, you know, images of Roman Empire people, men with short hair and women with long hair. And they'll say, well, that's when the trend started. That's when men started to have short hair. But you know what? I had a look at some of the Egyptian pictures. Um, you, know, the, you know, the Egyptian, you know, they had all these, what do they call them? Egyptian, something graphs. I can't remember what the word is. Anyway, you know, what, you know what I'm referring to. And I looked at pictures of men and pictures of women very clearly. Again, these Roman, uh, sorry, these Egyptian pictures, you know, thousands of years ago, one of the earliest civilizations of man very distinctly, women having long hair and men having short hair. The only men that I saw in those images that had long hair were kind of like the pharaohs, like the people in, in, in power. And that's because they used to wear a wig. It wasn't even their own hair. They had a wig they put on to kind of demonstrate their power and their authority. So even for thousands of years, through civilizations that worshipped false gods, that didn't have the God of the Bible, they knew that men ought to have short hair and that women ought to have long hair. Hey, we see that in our society that doesn't care about going to church. We still see that as the common uh, rule of thumb. That's just the way God has made man and woman uh, to feel uh, glory, not to feel ashamed of themselves. Now, verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Hey, you long hair on a lady, that's glorious. Okay, it's beautiful. It's comely. Okay, it's proper. It is a glory for her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So there's that reference. Her hair is given, for a given her for a covering. So a lot of, you know, other churches have implemented this. Oh, I've got to have a cover. So they wear a bonnet to church or they wear a ribbon on their head because they feel, oh, I need to cover myself. But no, the Bible clearly states that your hair is that covering. Okay? And these are things that ought to distinguish between man and woman, especially now in our current climate, especially in our current society, where they're trying to bend the genders, right? They're trying to blend them, right? There's, not, you know, you, there's no difference between a man. You know, God makes it very clear that we ought to have distinctions between man and woman. The length of your hair is a great way to distinguish between whether a man or a woman. There are times where I'm driving past and I see a woman with long hair, short hair, and I'm wondering, is that a man or a woman? Because not just the, the short hair, but also the way she's dressed, okay? And same with a man, a man with long hair. Sometimes you're wondering, is that a woman? Is that a man? 
I mean, many times, that, that, you know, that's not God's plan. God wants clear distinctions between man and woman with the length of your hair. And at some point later, I'll preach, obviously, on our clothing as well. Our clothing ought to distinguish us between man and woman, especially in our society now that is trying to do away with the two genders, with the two sexes. Now look at verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. So if someone in your church is contentious, meaning they don't follow this rule that we just read. You know, a man comes in here with long hair. A woman comes in here with short hair. It says, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now it's not saying that what we just read doesn't mean anything to them. Obviously it's still applicable, but it's not like we can kick that person out of the church. It's not like we can force them to cut their hair if it's a man, you know, or, or, or whatever, or, or force that woman to grow her hair if she's a woman, right? It's not something we can enforce in the church. It's not something we ought to kick people out of. So in, in, instead of being contentious about this, just let them come to church. A man comes with long hair. Hey, don't make him feel uncomfortable. A woman comes in with short hair. Don't make her feel uncomfortable. At some point, when I preach on this again, they'll know what we believe. And hopefully, you know, with the Lord's leading, they'll be able to change that about their appearance. But please don't make people that come into church with the wrong length of hair, you know, uncomfortable. But here's what happens. When you read a verse like this, and this ought to be simple things, people often ask, well, you know, how short is short? How long is long? You know, Kevin, can you give me a measurement? Like, how short should a man have? And how, how long should a woman have a hair? And it's these kind of questions that frustrate me. Right? It's these kind of questions that frustrate me. Because doth not even nature itself teach you. Okay? If you're a man, you know what short hair is. And if you're a woman, you know what long hair is. You don't need to ask me what that length is. The Bible doesn't tell us. Okay? God doesn't want to make us feel like we're in this prison cell. We've got to you know, you know, uh, um, you know, comply to, to measurements of hair. You know if your hair's short enough, right? I mean, if someone starts saying to you, hey, your hair's getting pretty long as a man. You know, your hair's getting pretty long. Hey, it probably is getting pretty long. You know, you might as well cut it, you know. Just keep your hair at a, at a point where it's obvious that it's short. And same thing with women. You know, someone says, hey, your hair's a bit short. Or you think, hey, my hair's a bit short. Well, yeah, your hair's short then, you know. Obviously, have it at a length where it's obvious. Where, hey, it's long hair. And men, hey, yeah, it's short hair. Okay, where's that line? If you start looking for that line, it tells me that you're trying to get as close to that line. You're trying to be, you know, where, you know I can, as close to the line where I can be right with God. But hey, if you want to be right with God, just be distinct. Just have the long hair, women and, and men just have the short hair. And you know, um, the school that I, I went to, a Christian school, a private school, and they had regulations, and it was really frustrating. Like for example, you know, if, if you were a boy and your hair was growing over your ears, you know, they'd send you home to cut your hair. Or if your hair was over your, your um, collar, and I, I get a lot of hair like on my neck, but if your hair gets over your collar, then you, you get sent home to, to get your hair cut as well. That was the rules, in, in, which is kind of frustrating because even if it's a little bit like that, it's not really that long. And like I said, because I, I, I get hair on my neck, quite often my hair was on my collar. And, you know, I always had to make sure that I had a short, you know, the hair at the back of my neck was short. But I don't want to make those rules in this church. I don't want to say to you, hey, you know, this is, this is the length and this is how short or whatever. And that'd be really frustrating. And that would be a waste of time. Just, you know, follow what nature has taught you. Women, long hair. Men short hair, and of course, some women might have a medical condition where they can't grow long hair. You know what? You do what you can. The Lord knows your situation. This is something between you and the Lord. It's not something that the church can enforce or force, force upon you. Okay, let's look at verse 17. We move on to the topic now of the Lord's Supper, okay? The first thing we'll notice, again, Paul just reinforcing or just, just again confirming the fact that the Corinthian church were having some major divisions in their church, right? Verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. So I've praised you before because you keep me in remembrance. I praise you before because you're keeping the ordinances that I left you. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together not for the better but for the worse. So they were, they were coming together and they were making things worse. In what way? For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. We know there were divisions amongst them leading up to this, right? We know there are divisions, and Paul says, I believe it. I partly believe the, the rumors that I'm hearing. Verse 19, for there must be also heresies among you. So the fact that there are divisions among you, Paul says, if, div if your church is divided, 
there must be heresy as well that's causing division in your church. Okay? We won't go into that too much now because we don't really have a list of the heresies here in this chapter or anything like that. Uh, but then it says that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So there is a benefit to having heresies and division in a church. Now that's not an ideal scenario, but the benefit of having heresies and division in a church is that those that are approved may be made manifest among you. Okay, now I'll just read to you 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when there comes a time of, 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 of heresy, you're going to know the individuals that are not novices. Okay? If someone holds on to heretical doctrine, you know, hey, they are novices. They are novices. But those that are sound in faith, those that know the Word of God, those that are approved because they've studied the Word of God and know it, they're going to be made manifest in an environment of division, in an environment of heresies. So that's the, that's the only really one benefit is that those, you know, those people that you want to make as leaders, maybe potential pastors in the future, will, will shine when those heresies come in, those, in, in that church. So he's addressing this topic of divisions. Don't forget that as we read on. Verse number 20. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now some people have read this and understood it to mean church, when we come together in one place to have church, that is not when we ought to have the Lord's Supper. That is, that is not the time that we ought to break bread and share in that grape juice that we normally do. Some people have read that and understood that. Because it kind of sounds like that, right? It sounds like when you come to one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. But that's if you read that verse on its own. I mean, if you read the next verse, it makes clear what it's being referred to. And I'll just, let's read verse 21, then I'll explain it to you. Verse 21, For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. So this church that's ha that has divisions, this church that Paul is not praising for what they're doing here, when they come together to have what they, ref what they should have be having is the Lord's Supper, he's saying, you're not coming for the Lord's Supper. This is not the Lord's Supper that you're doing. Because look at verse number 21. For in eating, everyone taketh other his own supper. So instead of having the Lord's Supper, they were having their own supper. Okay? In what way were they having their own supper? And one is hungry and another is drunken. Verse 22, What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So what was happening is when they should have waited for one another, when they should have been thinking about the Lord, when they were having the Lord's Supper, instead, they were just gorging themselves with food. You know, those that came first would eat all the food. They wouldn't worry about those that were hungry. They'd just fill themselves up. Look at verse number 21 again. And one is hungry, and another, one, another is drunken. So you have some people eating, and others are not eating. Some are drunken, and some are not drunken. Some are, some are thirsty. Now, again, let me just clarify a few things here. That word drunken. I've heard this verse used to, um, to teach that when the Corinthian church were, was having the Lord's Supper, and you know how we have the grape juice, that their grape juice was alcoholic. They were drinking alcoholic wine, and that's why some were drunken. Okay, if, uh, has anyone heard that one? No one? <laughs> okay, because the word drunken can mean intoxicated. It can. And more often than not in the Bible, yes, drunken does mean intoxicated. But it doesn't just mean intoxicated. The word drunken also means filled. Okay? It's like a past tense uh, of, 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 of drink. Okay? It's an old English word. We don't use it so much now, but in, in, in the 1600s, you know how we say drank you know, as, as the past tense of drink? Well, in the 1600s, they would use the word drunk as the past tense. To drink. Um, I'll just give you one example of this. You don't need to turn there. I'll just give you one example from, uh, from the Bible. Lamentations 5.4. Lamentations 5.4. It says, we have drunken, so is this intoxication? We have drunken our water for money. Our wood is sold unto us. So we have drunken our water. So can you get intoxicated on water? No, right? Because drunken is also a past tense of drink. 
in the Bible. That's just one example. Where obviously they weren't getting drunk, intoxicated on water. They were just filled with water in that reference there in Lamentations 5.4. And so when we read this in context of, what, you know, of one being hungry in verse 21, another is drunken, meaning some have eaten, some have drunk all the juice, where others are hungry and others are thirsty. They weren't waiting for one another. They were having their own supper without considering the others and not really having the Lord's Supper, which is meant to be a unity of believers. Okay? And the other reason why this cannot be intoxication is because otherwise, Paul is giving them the go-ahead to get drunk in their own houses. Because it says, hey, in verse 21, hey, another is drunken. Verse 22, what? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? So you're getting, like, let's say it was alcohol and they were getting intoxicated. So you're getting drunk in church. What? Don't you have houses to drink in? So like, well, you, at your house you can get drunk, but not in church. So it's, you know, it, it just messes up what this, this passage is about. It's about waiting for one another and not just gorging yourself with food and with drink um, and not thinking about other people. But look at verse 23. Now we get into the instructions of the Lord's Supper. Verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which, I also, which also I delivered unto you, that the name of Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So when we partake of the bread and of the grape juice, the, the bread, which is unleavened bread, I'll show you later on, represents his body. Okay? It represents his broken body for us. That it was, it was beaten, it was bruised, it was nailed to the cross. This perfect Lamb of God that gave himself for us. That's what the bread represents, his broken body. Okay? That's why we break the bread, because it represents his body being broken for us. And then the cup, the grape juice, represents the New Testament in his blood. The grape juice represents his blood that was shed on Calvary. In fact, his blood was shed leading up to Calvary as well as you well know, being whipped, being beaten, the crown of thorns, all that stuff that happened to Jesus Christ. That blood that was shed is represented in the grape juice that we drink, which ushered in that New Testament for us. Now, if you can keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and turn to Luke 22. I just want to show you a few things here and tie it all up together for you. Luke chapter 22, verse 8. This might be a bit of a long sermon, but I want to get through it all today. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, keep a finger in 1 Corinthians 11. Because what Paul is referencing here in 1 Corinthians 11 is taken out of Luke chapter 22. Okay, Luke 22 verse 8. And he sent Peter and John, so Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. So this is the last supper. This is the day before Jesus Christ is being, uh, well actually maybe not the day before where, where these instructions are given, but when they partook of the Last Supper, it was the day before he was crucified. Okay, it was the day before he was crucified. And Christ says, hey, prepare the Passover. Okay, verse 14. And when, look at down at verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So were they going to have partake of the Passover? Yes, they were. But Jesus Christ was crucified on a Wednesday. This last supper was on a Tuesday. And the Passover, we won't go through all of, it, all of it now, was on the 14th day of the month Nisan, the first month on the Jewish calendar, which actually fell on, on the Wednesday. That was when they were to kill the Passover, uh, cook it, and eat it. So what they're doing is they're having the Passover one day early. Why? Because when Jesus Christ was crucified, he became the Passover. He fulfilled the Passover. He was crucified on the same day that the lamb would be, would be killed and eaten on the 14th uh, day of Nisan. One day I'm going to go through all of this information, like every day of that week, because there's, there's a lot of cool uh, parallels. There's a lot of good, good teaching that you can get out of that week. Uh, so they're having it a little bit early. Okay, verse 15. And he said unto them, with desire, I've already read that, verse 16. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. 
And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup of the supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. So the first thing I want to ask you guys or suggest to you guys is, ask the question is this, why do we have unleavened bread? Why is it when we partake of the Lord's Supper that we do it with unleavened bread? Did you know there's no New Testament reference that says you need to have it with unleavened bread? That's a true statement. But if we understand what led up to the Last Supper, Jesus told them, prepare the Passover. Remember that? Prepare the Passover. So what they were consuming during the Last Supper, uh, sorry, the, the, the Last um, Supper, they, ha- you know, it, they, weren't, they weren't killing a lamb, okay, because Jesus Christ... It, it happened the next day, and Jesus Christ was at sacrifice, but they were doing everything else at this point in time except for the lamb, okay? They were eating the bread and drinking of the cup. Now, some people say, well, the reason why we have unleavened bread is because leaven is a picture of sin. Okay, I've, I've heard that talk. In fact, I think that's the, the main reason I've heard of us having unleavened bread, because leaven is a picture of sin. And that's true. Many times in the Bible... Leaven is a picture of sin, but it's not always a picture of sin, okay? Now, if you can, are you, can, you, can you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and stay in Luke 22, please? Stay in Luke 22 and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Because we already read this when we went through uh, chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. This is a chapter about kicking someone, a sinner, out of the church. This is a chapter about kicking certain people out of the church. Verse 7 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So you understand in the context that this is about kicking out a sinner. Okay, kicking out people that have done certain sins out of the church, so they would not leaven the whole church. Okay, and that's a picture there of, 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 um, of, um, of the Passover. So it is true in a sense that we can say, yes, leaven represents sin or represents a sinner that we must cast out of the church. So I'm not against that. In fact, I think that's a legitimate reason why we ought to have unleavened bread. But I want to show you, if you can turn to Deuteronomy 16, it is a bit of a Bible study today. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 2. I want to show you exactly why in the Old Testament uh, the Israelites had the unleavened bread. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 2. Because if you, know, if, you, if you know the feast, they would have the Passover and then they'll have seven days of unleavened bread. Seven days, a whole week, where they would just eat bread that was unleavened. And Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 2 explains why they had the unleavened bread when they had the Passover. Deuteronomy 16, verse 2 and, and, and 3. Verse 2. <clears throat> thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock of the herd in the place which the Lord hath chosen to place his name there. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread. Okay? So no bread with kind of yeast. No bread with leaven. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. Why? Why? For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste. You came out of Egypt quickly, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. So unleavened bread represents the haste, how quickly they came out of Egypt. Because if you know the story of the Passover, where they took the lamb, and they took the blood of the lamb, and they put it on the doorposts, right? And they roasted the lamb with fire, and they ate the unleavened bread. The instruction was, hey, be dressed, be ready, be ready to go. Because that night, when the Lord passed over the Israelites, because they had the blood of the lamb, which represents the blood of Jesus Christ, God killed the firstborn of every Egyptian, both man and beast, right? And the next day, Pharaoh is so grieved because he lost his own son, that he lets Egypt go, right? The Israelites were not to leave their house with the blood on the doorpost until the morning. And they left in haste. They left quickly. They were dressed. They were ready to go. Okay? And so when you cook unleavened bread, as soon as it's cooked, you can eat it. You can eat it quickly. You can eat it in haste. 
But if you have leaven, or if you have yeast, it takes time for the bread to rise. Okay, you've got to wait for the bread to rise and then you can eat it, right? And so if they were waiting for the bread to rise, they wouldn't have time to eat the bread to leave. And so what I'm trying to say to you is that this is a picture of salvation. When, when we have the blood of Christ upon us, God passes over us, He forgives us because of, of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and immediately you are saved. You are saved immediately. It's not a process. You don't have to keep doing certain commandments or do any work to be saved. You have the blood applied on you with haste. You are saved. You come out of Egypt. When the Israelites came out of Egypt and were delivered out of Egypt, that's a picture of our salvation when we're delivered from sin, when we're delivered from the power of sin, and we're, we're saved. It's immediate. It's not a process. That's what the unleavened bread represented. You're saved immediately. As soon as they left their house with that blood, they left Egypt. It was done. They were saved out of Egypt, which is a picture of our salvation. So when we eat the unleavened bread, we're to remember, hey, we're saved. It was immediate. Thank God for the Passover that was shed, the blood that was shed of Jesus Christ. We are saved. The unleavened bread represents our eternal security, not some process of salvation. Okay, something that you need to wait for. Yeast of a bread that you need to wait for the bread to rise before you can eat it. No, it's immediate. Okay, that's what it pictures during the Passover that they had left in haste. It was done immediately. The next morning they were free as soon as they came out of the, their doorposts. Okay, came out from under their doorposts. Same thing for us, guys. Salvation is immediate. Don't forget that. It's not a process. People that say, well, I've got to wait to see if you're actually performing right. I've got to wait to see if you're keeping the commandments. I've got to wait if you've met this arbitrary level of, of my personal satisfaction before I say you're saved. No, as soon as the blood of the Lamb is applied to you by believing on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are saved immediately. And that's what the unleavened bread represents when we partake of that in the Lord's Supper. And immediately, the next question would be, well, is it unleavened grape juice? Because obviously when we talk about wine and grape juice, people talk about it being alcoholic or non-alcoholic. Well, the same thing. If you're going to make alcoholic wine, it's not immediate, right? If you took grapes and just squeezed the grapes and you had something in haste, you'd drink it freshly squeezed, wouldn't you? But if you were, having a, if you were going to make alcoholic beverage, that takes time. It's a process. You need to also wait for the leaven to change that sugar into alcohol. And of course, you know, we shouldn't be drinking alcohol in the first place, but I'm just going to show you that it's the same principle for the grape juice. Okay? Now, I don't know if you've still, you still got a finger in Luke 22. If you don't, that's fine. I'll just read to you Luke 22, verse 18 again. Even Jesus says this, Luke 22, verse 18, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. So what drink were they drinking? Was it alcohol? No, it was fruit of the vine. They had prepared for the Passover. If they prepared for the Passover, they would have had unleavened bread and they would have had the freshly squeezed juice because it represented how quickly they came out of Egypt. Jesus calls it the fruit of the vine. Okay? So three reasons why the grape juice we drink on the Lord's Supper ought not to be alcoholic grape juice, ought not to be alcoholic wine. Number one, yes, leaven is a picture of sin, and Christ was sinless. So yes, I accept that. But number two, Jesus Christ himself said that the juice he drank from was the, juice of, uh, was the, juice, was the fruit of the vine, the grape vine. Now someone might argue and say, well, well you know, alcohol, you know, alcoholic wine is also fruit of the vine. Well, that's why we've got reason number three is because leavened or alcoholic wine takes time to prepare and that's not what they were doing during the Passover. They were ready to go as soon as, you know, Pharaoh had let them go. Okay, so I just want to give you the reasons why we have the unleavened bread and freshly squeezed grape juice when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, if you can go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. The next question is, well, how often, how often should we partake of the Lord's Supper? Some churches do it every week. Some churches do it every month. Our church, I'm going to implement that we do it every three months, roughly every three months. It doesn't have to be exactly the Sunday, every, every Sunday or the third month, but, but, you know, roughly every three months. Some churches do it once a year. Now, let me just quickly say, the churches that do it once a year is because they see that they prepared for the Passover and they believe it's a continuation of the Passover. And because the Passover was done once a year, they think, well, we should have the Lord's Supper once a year. 
Okay? I do not believe that because I believe Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the Passover and Christ was instituting a new ordinance for the church, a okay? brand new ordinance. And if you read the, the, the book of Acts, you'll find often they were breaking bread. Almost, it, it seemed like in some cases, as often as they were meeting, they were breaking bread and doing this. Okay? But let's look at verse 26. So how often should we do it? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So it's not a question of how often, it's a statement of, of as often, okay? So it's not right to do it once a, it's not saying that it's wrong or, or right to do it, you know, once a week, once a month, whatever it is. It's just saying do it. As often as you do it, this shows the Lord's death till he comes. So this is a practice for churches till the rapture, till the resurrection, until we go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is something that churches ought to do till he comes as often. So it's left up to us to decide how often we do it. The reason I, I like to do it once every three months, so it doesn't become mundane. So it's not something that we do so often that we kind of forget the importance of it. But it's also something, I don't want to do it once a year either because then it's so far away, you know, and if, if you can't make it that one time, then you're actually going to miss for two years before you have the Lord's uh, Supper. So the other thing is I want you to think about, you know, I don't want it to, like I said, I don't want it to become a mundane task. I want to do it every three months. But it's also called the Lord's Supper, okay? And again, this is something that I don't like about some churches. Again, look, they can do it the way they want. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I don't, I don't like it when it's just a normal church service and then they give you a little bit of grape juice and, and the bread right at the end. You know, it's, it's called supper for a reason. And so every time we do it, we're going to have supper together. We're going to have dinner together. We're going to have a meal together, just like the Corinthian church should have waited together to eat together, and then we'll break the bread and drink the grape juice and we're going to be doing it this coming Saturday. Okay, so if you can come to the Soul Winning Marathon after the church service at 3.30, you know, we're going to have dinner together, and after dinner we're going to have the Lord's Supper. Okay, so it's not the Lord's lunch, it's not the Lord's breakfast, it's the Lord's Supper, it's something done as an evening meal. Okay, so please, if you can come to the Soul Winning Marathon, we're going to be doing that in the evening as well. Okay, look at uh, verse 27, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood, sorry, of the body and blood of the Lord. So we're instructed to partake of the Lord's Supper worthily. Because if you do it unworthily, you are guilty of the body and blood of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 28. But let a man examine himself. So how can we make ourselves worthy? Every man, let a man examine himself. It's not my job to examine you. It's not my job to determine whether you're worthy or not to partake of this. But let me just ask you the, a question. How are we worthy before God? What makes us worthy before God? Is it our own righteousness? Of course not. It's the righteousness of Christ, right? It's the righteousness of Christ. So the first thing you need to consider before you partake of the Lord's Supper, am I even saved? Have I believed on the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection? Because if I have, then I am worthy in His sight, right? That is the first question that you ought to ask yourself, am I saved? And of course, I mean, I'm not asking you to doubt your salvation, but obviously if you're saved, you can partake of the Lord's Supper. That's the first thing. Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, so we, God wants us to partake of this. This is something he wants us to partake of, not to be fearful of partaking it in case we're made guilty. Verse 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You're not taking this seriously. You're not understanding what you're doing. It's a fearful thing if you partake of the Lord's Supper and you're not even saved. Okay? So salvation is the first thing, but it's also a time of self-examination. Okay, a time of self-examination. Examine yourself. Turn to John chapter 13, please. We're going to look. At, I've already taught on this, but I want to teach on this very quickly again. John chapter 13. Again, keep a finger in 1 Corinthians 11 if you can. John chapter 13, verse 2. Because we have a, a, a picture of this, of this examination after the Lord's Supper, after Jesus Christ uh, took part of the Lord's Supper. Look at this um, practical uh, demonstration here in John 13, verse 2. And supper being ended, so after supper was had, this is at, at the Last Supper, 
The devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Simon saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Like, are you serious, Jesus? You're going to come and wash my feet? Verse 7, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. You're going to understand later on, after I wash your feet, why I've done this. Verse 8, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. No part with me. No fellowship with me if I don't wash your feet, Peter. And then um, verse 9, Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Wash me from top to bottom, Peter says, right? Because I want to be part of you. I want to be in fellowship with you. Okay, and then Jesus says in verse 10, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not. So you don't need to be washed all over again, Peter. Save or accept to wash his feet. But he's clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. So he's saying to all the twelve disciples, you're clean, but not all. Why? Because we read about Judas Iscariot being the betrayer of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 11. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Okay, so they were all saved at this point, except one, and that was Judas Iscariot. Okay? Um, so what, we, what do we learn here? Do we need to be re-saved? If you're saved, you believe in Christ, do you need to be re-saved again? Of course not. You're already clean. But what's the principle that we learned there? That we need our feet washed. Okay? Because as you go through life, you are going to, you are going to accumulate sins in your life. Okay? And that's going to break fellowship with God. Jesus says, you can't have any part with me. And so when we come to partake of the Lord's Supper and we examine ourselves, yes, we need to make sure that we're saved, make sure that we're clean, as Jesus showed in his practice there, but we need to make sure that our feet are clean. I'm not saying literally our feet. I'm not going to bring water and get our feet all washed, but I'm saying the sins that we've accumulated in our, in our life through the week, through the days, you need to confess those sins to the Lord and ask for forgiveness before you partake of the Lord's Supper, which is why I always make sure we have a time of silent prayer so you can use that time to confess those sins to God. Hey, partake of it. Partake of the Lord's Supper. All you need to do, hey, is just humble yourself before God. Say, God, you know I'm a sinner. I've committed these sins. Please forgive me for them so I can, you know, freely, without guilt, partake of this bread and this wine so I can remember your, 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 um, you know, your death uh, in the church. So that's how, we, that's how we're worthy. First, you're saved, but then you're also cleansed from your sins before you partake of the Lord's Supper. Very important, if you're back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30. Why is this so important? Look at this. For this cause, or for this reason, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So there were some people in this church that were not taking the Lord's Supper seriously. Of course, they were taking their own supper. Remember that? We read that earlier. They were having divisions amongst themselves. They didn't care for their fellow brethren if they were hungry or if they were thirsty. And some may not even have been saved in the church or they weren't having their feet washed before partaking of that, you know, that ordinance. And so because of that, some have fallen sick in the church and even some have slept, meaning some have died. God put some believers to death for not taking the Lord's Supper seriously. It's a serious ordinance that we need to partake of and consider and examine ourselves before we do that. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, or that's examine ourselves, if we were to judge and examine ourselves, we should not be judged. Hey, so if we confess our sins before God, God's not going to judge you, okay, or, or cause these things to happen upon you because you've judged yourself, you've humbled yourself before God, confessed your sins before Him. Verse 32, but when we are judged, so if God does judge you, we are chastised, uh, chastened, sorry, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned 
with the world. So let me just quickly show you the difference there with a believer. If God judges us, you know, we're not humble and, and, and ask for forgiveness and God needs to put his hand of chastisement upon us, it says that we will be chastised or cha uh, chastened of the Lord. But if you're a believer, you're not going to be condemned with the world. Okay, so there's a difference. Obviously, we've been cursed, we've been damned, we've been condemned with unbelievers. That's not your category, but you will be chastened by the Lord, and the Lord can even chasten you with death. That's pretty bad, right? Because we think that that's, that's the extreme. Surely God will not put his own people to death. Well, hey, if you're better off dead than alive for God, because maybe you're, 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 you're causing divisions in church, you're of no profit to God at all on this earth, yeah, he might as well just put you to death. It'd be a blessing for you to just be in heaven instead of just destroying your life upon this earth. You may be chastised by God in that way. Hey, but you're not going to be condemned like the world is condemned uh, without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, hey, there's heavy chastisement if we don't part you know, um, pay attention to the Lord's table, if we don't do it properly, which is why I'm preaching quite a, a lengthy sermon on this topic because I want you to understand everything that it, it involves, okay? Why it's so important. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 11.33. The last thing I want to talk to you guys about is this. The Lord's Supper is a time to be united. The Lord's Supper is a time to be united as a church. Yes, we're all different. Yes, we might even have different beliefs on some secondary issues, okay? But it's not a time like the Corinthian church that had divisions. No, it's a time of unity. Okay, look at verse 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat... Tarry one for another. Hey, wait for one another. Make sure there's enough food and drink for everyone to be shared. Okay? This ought to bring you together. We're remembering the Lord's death. We're remembering the thing that we have in common. You know, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anything that's going to bring a church together in unity, it's remembering the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's remembering his great love, his great sacrifice to save us from our sins and to save us from hell. Hey, wait for one another, okay? We've all been purchased by the same blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 34, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home that ye come together, sorry, that ye come not together unto condemnation and the rest will I set in order when I come. So saying, hey, look, if you can't wait, like if you can't wait for your brothers before you partake of that meal together, just eat at home first. So you're not so hungry that you eat and then you bring condemnation upon yourself and cause divisions in the church, okay? You might as well just eat at home. If you're super hungry, just eat at home, but then, you know, make sure that we partake of the Lord's Supper together. Now, go back to one chapter before this, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, just one chapter before this, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because the Lord's Supper is a time to be united. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Look at this. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many, so we being many in the church, we are many, are one bread and one body. Okay? So when we remember the body of Christ being sacrificed, we're also remembering the fact that we, though we are many, are one bread, are one body, because we're in Christ. Okay? The Lord's Supper is a time to be united as a church. It's not a time of division. It's a time of unity. One body, one bread, for we are all partakers of that one bread. We've all been saved by the bread which represents Christ's body on the cross. Okay, it's a time of unity and you can see the problem that the Corinthian church had with the divisions, which is why Paul is addressing this topic of communion, this topic of the Lord's Supper. Hey, this is a time to come together. This is a time to remember the Lord's death. Let's not have divisions over this. Let's have unity together in this area. Now, the Lord's Supper is a simple process. It really should be, right? The blood. The grape juice. The blood of Christ is represented by the grape juice. His broken body is represented by the bread. So we can remember. Isn't that, isn't that such a simple ordinance? Isn't it uh, eating? We, we eat every day. We drink every day. Hey, we're just doing it in a special way, remembering the Lord's death. It's easy, isn't it? It's not complicated. And I get so angry. I get so frustrated when people divide. And I've seen this. People divide 
not just on other things, on, on doctrines or whatever, but divide over how they ought to administer the Lord's Supper. It's what's it's, it's what meant to bring the church together, and they divide something so simple, the bread and the grape juice, and I've seen, you know, look, different pastors, different churches have different ways of doing it. That's fine. That's fine. Some do it once every week. Some do it every month. Some do it every year. That's fine. Some people have it open to everybody in the church. Some have it closed to just those that are members. Some people say, hey, you need to be, it's not just saved, but you also need to be baptized before you can. Look, people have all kinds of rules and regulations. And if you're, like, this church isn't open, so I'm not so much talking about you guys, but if there's anyone else listening to me on the YouTube world, and they do not go to a church because they're not happy with the way the Lord's Supper is done. And I've heard believers not go to churches because of the way the Lord's Supper is, to be, is, is done in that church. You know, you've got a wrong spirit. You've got a spirit of division, and you're not coming together for something that's meant to be simple, which is just partaking of the bread and the Lord's Supper. I'll give you one example of this. My parents, when they migrated from Chile to Australia, they grew up as Presbyterians. They were Presbyterians. And as Presbyterians, as you probably know, children are baptized, you know, sprinkled or poured or water. Or if you, you convert later in life, you still get poured or sprinkled upon. They don't do baptism by immersion. And obviously, I don't agree with that. I, don't, I, I believe that's wrong. I believe the biblical practice, we're a Baptist church, the biblical practice is baptism by immersion, okay? So I'm not saying what, what my parents had done in their church was right or anything like that. But when they migrated to Australia, they joined a Baptist church, okay? And they were not allowed to partake of the Lord's Supper because the pastor had a rule where well, you need to be baptized by immersion first. Okay, you've only been sprinkled, you've only been poured, you're bapt you, you know. And my parents know that baptism does not save anybody. You know, even, even the pouring and the sprinkling has nothing to do with salvation as far as the churches they came from. Maybe some Presbyterian churches believe that, but not the churches they were part of. And so they disagreed with this. They, they thought it was wrong that we need to be baptized. They wanted to obviously partake of the Lord's Supper, right? They felt they've already been baptized, though I don't believe they were, you know, not scripturally baptized, but that's what they felt. But instead of causing division, instead of arguing about it, yes, they, they had their say, and then they, they couldn't get their way. So instead of, you know, arguing and they realized, hey, no, this is a time of unity for the church, they got baptized, you know, they were baptized by the pastor, by immersion, though they did not feel compelled to do so, they did so for the sake of unity in the church. They did so so they could partake of the Lord's Supper. And I respect them for that. I respect them for that because I know there are other Christians out there that would say, no, I don't have to do that. This is wrong and I'm going to leave the church or try to cause division, try to, you know, try to you know, blame the pastor or other things, try to get someone else in, in authority and power that will, will, will get their way. No, that is, that is a wrong spirit to have. And let me just say to you now, if, 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 if the only church you're in that's a good church has certain rules about partaking of the Lord's Supper and you're not happy with that, hey, just go with what the man of God says. Just go with what the pastor says. It's meant to be a time of unity, okay? Just do it for the sake of the church. Do it for the sake of the unity in the church and just put aside the differences that you may have in this area, okay? Um, so, yeah, again, guys, it's a time of unity. And if, you know what, if there were major divisions in this church, I would not have the Lord's Supper until we could get unity with it amongst ourselves. And I'm glad that, you know, that's not the case in this church anyway. But I'm just saying to you, if, if I ever prolong the Lord's Supper, it's probably because I'm dealing with some sort of division that we need to fix before we do so. So I hope that's given you some, some other, you know, some ideas and thoughts maybe that you may not have had previously. I know it's a bit of a long sermon. I apologize for that. But it is an important topic. And, uh, you know, I hope you can make it to the Soul Winning Marathon on the 31st of March because after dinner, that's when we will be partaking of the Lord's Supper together. Let's pray.